I'm so sorry for being late. I burst into the conference room, ready to drop to my knees in apology. How long are you going to make us wait? We might as well call this deal off right now. I've really done it this time. My mind goes completely blank. But right now, all I can do is bow my head and beg for forgiveness, pleading for this negotiation to somehow continue smoothly. The fate of our company is at stake. Everything I've worked for up until now hinges on this very moment. What have I done? But I don't regret it. Because the person I helped was the one I had once loved. The moment she saw me, her eyes welled up with tears, and she said, it's not a dream, is it? All right, with this much time, I can still make it. I checked the time on the watch I bought with my first bonus after starting work, and I felt relieved, knowing I'd still arrive with time to spare. My name is Michael. Today, I'm feeling more nervous than usual as I head to meet our client, Company K. The reason for my anxiety is that Company K is a major player in the elderly care products industry. Consistently ranking first or second in market share, and after years of building connections and numerous presentations, our company finally secured this negotiation. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say our company's future hinges on this deal. If the negotiation goes well, we're sure to get a nice bonus. It would be the biggest achievement since our company was founded. I come from a single parent family, and my mom worked as a caregiver to put me through college. While I only managed to get into an obscure third-rate university due to a life filled with part-time jobs since high school, I have confidence that the people skills and tenacity I developed through my jobs in the service industry give me an edge over graduates from elite universities. As I got off the train at the station nearest to Company K, I thought I'd grab an iced coffee from a convenience store just off the main road to shield myself from the afternoon sun. But as I was walking, I saw something on the sidewalk ahead. A bag? What is that? I wondered, but I was too busy going over the negotiation plan in my head to pay much attention until I passed by it. Then I was startled. It was a person. A young woman was collapsed, leaning against a hedge. I rushed over and tried to call out to her. Are you okay? Can you hear me? There was no response at all. Maybe she'd been in an accident. I knew it wasn't wise to move her without knowing what happened, but I couldn't just leave her there without checking if she was okay. So, I carefully lifted her up. Still, there was no reaction. Seeing her face, I called out a name I hadn't said in years. Emily. How many years has it been since I last said that name? She was my old girlfriend, Emily Thompson. A wave of nostalgia washed over me, but now wasn't the time for reminiscing. I didn't know what had happened to her, but she was unconscious. It was a matter of urgency. I pulled out my phone, checked my location via GPS, and immediately called for an ambulance. Fortunately, the ambulance arrived in less than 10 minutes, and the paramedics rushed over with a stretcher. I explained her condition when I found her, told them she was a friend named Emily, but that I didn't know her current address. Since I knew her, they suggested I ride along in the ambulance, and I, worried about her, quickly agreed. Inside, the paramedics worked efficiently, and all I could do was hold her hand tightly and call her name. But why is she here in Tokyo? That thought suddenly crossed my mind. We had dated during our college years. After that, I started working for a company in Tokyo, while Emily took a job back home, and we began a long-distance relationship. In the beginning, we stayed in frequent contact, but after a while, communication from her side suddenly stopped. I got busy with work, and our relationship quietly faded away. I convinced myself that the distance had made her uneasy, and maybe she'd found someone she liked more than me. 
I tried to forget about her. But I couldn't forget her. I kept thinking about her, dragging those feelings with me for so long that I thought I could never love anyone else again. Just as I was getting lost in those thoughts, feeling a bit sentimental, the ambulance arrived at a hospital. She was carried inside and taken to a treatment room for examination. Then, it suddenly hit me, I remembered something terrible. Damn it! I rushed outside the hospital and checked my phone, only to find a flood of missed calls. Things were definitely looking bad. So I quickly went to the emergency room reception and explained that I was an acquaintance of the woman who had just been brought in. I told them I had to leave because I was in the middle of work. I promised I would come back as soon as I finished, and with a heavy heart, I rushed off to Company K. The hospital was only a few minutes away by taxi. I apologized for being late at the reception desk of Company K, and as I was led to the conference room, I saw my manager, Robert, waiting in the hallway. As soon as he spotted me, he began speaking rapidly, though without raising his voice. Hey! What happened? You didn't answer any calls, and I thought you might have been in an accident. What on earth happened? I didn't hide the reason for my delay. I'm really sorry for being late. On my way from the station, I found a woman I know collapsed on the street. I called an ambulance and accompanied her to the hospital. I forgot to call, and I really don't know how to apologize. Whether Robert believed me or not, he just said, well, the client is waiting for us, so make sure you do your best. And we both entered the conference room. To cut to the chase, the negotiation was a success. What made me happiest was that all our hard work had finally been recognized. But little did I know that this feeling of accomplishment would soon be shattered. Back at the office, I was summoned by Mr. Fletcher, the CEO, and told I would be removed from the project. I'm really glad we managed to succeed. Great job, everyone. Now, starting today, Michael will be stepping down from the project. This is my decision, but it reflects the consensus of the entire company. Thank you for your efforts up until now, Michael. Travis will be taking over. Travis, I'm counting on you. Travis, who had taken over my position, grinned and said, Thank you very much. I think Mr. Fletcher made the right call. We can't have someone who skips such an important meeting representing the company, it's a matter of trust. Travis, who had always treated me like a rival, took this opportunity to lay into me. Feeling completely unjust, I glared at Travis and confronted Mr. Fletcher. Excuse me, do you know how much effort I put into this project, Mr. Fletcher? Travis, mocking me, chimed in. Before being a professional, you failed at being a decent human. Showing up late without even a call? I thought you'd chickened out and run away. And look at you, acting all high and mighty just because your sales numbers are good, despite coming from some no-name third-rate university. Yes, I graduated from a so-called third-rate university. But that has nothing to do with this, does it? I admit I was wrong for not making a call, and I truly apologize for that. But the negotiation was successful. Do you have any idea how much I've invested in this? I've worked my way up from the bottom. Unlike you who have been on the fast track your whole life. I've worked 10, no, a hundred times harder than you have. And yet, hearing our argument, Robert sided with Travis. But Michael, Mr. Fletcher didn't decide this based solely on this incident. Six months ago, during the contract with Company S. We had to cover for your mistake, too. You almost caused the deal to fall apart when you upset their executive. And it was Travis's quick thinking that saved the day. 
I heard you even tried to take credit for that. Travis chimed in, pretending to reminisce. Oh, yeah, you went around bragging like it was all you're doing, didn't you? Without my quick thinking, that contract would have been dead in the water. I had no idea about any of this. Actually, that wasn't my fault. I wasn't directly involved in the company's project, I had only given advice to Alice, one of Travis's team members, so I could focus on the company K deal. Travis and Alice must have spread these lies. Damn it. I've been set up. Realizing that anything I said now would just sound like excuses, I kept quiet. Mr. Fletcher, looking at me for a moment, then said, Michael, you'll be contacted later with further instructions. For now, stay at home and wait. This isn't just about today's incident, I've had concerns about your attitude toward your colleagues for a while. But today confirmed it for me. I had high expectations of you, and I'm disappointed. Hearing Mr. Fletcher's words, my mind went blank. Michael, you really screwed up this time. Looks like you're definitely getting fired. Thanks for everything. But the company will be just fine without you. Rest in peace. Rest in peace, huh? Travis and Alice's mocking words barely registered in my mind. Feeling utterly defeated, as if all my hard work had been for nothing, I suddenly thought of Emily. That's right, Emily. When I left the hospital, the nurse had told me she'd be fine with some rest, but I couldn't stay still. I rushed to the hospital where she had been taken. At the reception desk, I was informed that she had regained consciousness and was now in her room. As I approached, I could see through the open door that Emily was sitting up in bed. Surprised, I called out to her from the hallway. Are you okay to be up already? Startled by my sudden voice, Emily turned to look at me and, seeing my face, she smiled. Michael. Uh, yeah, it's me. I knew it. It really is you, Michael. I thought I heard your voice in my dreams. So, you really were by my side. The nurse told me a man had accompanied me. Thank you for helping me. Luckily, I didn't get seriously hurt. I guess I just got a bit dizzy from being so tired. Must have scared you, huh? Hearing from her that she wasn't seriously injured, I felt relieved and shared my surprise at seeing her here in Tokyo. I never expected to see you here. She looked at me with disbelief and continued. No. I meant my face. That's when I noticed a large bruise stretching from her temple down her cheek. It wasn't there before. Emily looked down, trying to hide the injury, and began to tell me about a painful event that had happened without my knowing. The year after you left for Tokyo, there was a fire at my parents' house. I was unharmed, but my father died shielding me from a collapsing beam. I got burned on my face in the process, and it's been like this ever since. Seeing her smile sadly, I was at a loss for words. While I had lost contact with Emily, she had gone through such a terrible ordeal. And here I was, feeling sorry for myself, thinking she had just moved on and left me behind. I tried to cheer her up a little. Emily, I'm so sorry about your dad, but I'm really glad you're okay. And honestly, until you mentioned it just now, I didn't even notice the scar on your face. Maybe realizing I wasn't lying, Emily burst out laughing. Really? You didn't notice? No way. How could you be so clueless? Maybe it's because it's not as noticeable as you think. You haven't changed at all. And by that, I mean you're still as cute as ever. Though, to be honest, you've also grown more mature and, well, even more beautiful. It's kind of embarrassing. 
I've always liked your face. But I fell in love with your kind nature, the way you always put others before yourself. Really? Do I really come off like that? Seeing the disbelief on her face, I decided to share a story I had never told anyone before about why I fell for her. Back when we were in college, remember how I was a scholarship student from a single parent household and was working two jobs, day and night? Just to get by? Yeah, I remember. I used to wonder why someone who looked like they were just messing around was working so many jobs. Wait, you thought I was messing around? I was the most serious, struggling student ever. I meant how you looked. I had never realized people saw me that way. I continued with my story. So, one day, I was so exhausted that I overslept and missed the final lecture, the last one. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And that day of all days, it was Professor Williams's class, the strict one who'd automatically fail anyone caught cheating. Yeah, you definitely couldn't skip that one. As the nostalgic conversation continued, Emily's voice seemed to brighten. So, back then, we weren't even dating, just acquaintances from the same seminar. But you went to the professor's office to explain why I was absent. Saying you'd take responsibility for me and asking if he could let me continue attending the lectures. I was shocked when Professor Williams told me later. He even teased me, saying I'd found a great wife. What? He could joke like that? Yeah, I didn't know either. But until then, I just thought you were a sweet, gentle girl, and after that, seeing you stand up like that. How could I not fall in love? I felt a little embarrassed sharing this secret reason why I fell for her. With a single sentence I said to Emily, I realized I wasn't ready to let go of these feelings. I have to stay in the hospital for a while to rest, but if nothing else comes up, I'll be discharged soon. After that, I planned to stay around here for about another week. Not wanting to miss this chance, I told her. I'll come see you again. Noticing the intensity in my gaze, she fidgeted with her hands on the blanket and softly replied. Yeah. I'd like that. I'll be waiting. It felt like our first date all over again, we were both too shy to look at each other. The next day, I was rudely awakened by a phone call from the company, formally notifying me that I had been fired. Everything I had built up was suddenly destroyed, and while I was vaguely thinking about what to do next, I realized there was no time to feel sorry for myself. To keep living, I needed a job first. I decided I had to start looking for a new job. Three days later, I received a message from Emily saying she had been discharged from the hospital. She asked if we could meet the next day, and since I had plenty of free time after getting fired, I was more than happy to say yes. When I arrived at our meeting place, Emily was already there, and she greeted me with a smile. Sorry for the sudden invitation. Is everything okay with your work today? Not wanting her to worry. I answered in a deliberately cheerful voice. Oh, yeah. We just finished a big project, and I hadn't taken any days off for a while, so I had a lot of vacation days piled up. HR has been pestering me to use them, so I finally took a break. Hearing that, she looked relieved. We walked through the city together. We stopped at a store where she wanted to browse some accessories and enjoyed seasonal fruit juice from a stand. It felt like a date from our college days, a simple, happy time. Emily seemed delighted and said with a smile. I've always dreamed of walking around Tokyo with you like this. After we started our long-distance relationship, you only came back to visit a few times, and I never got to come here. I really wanted to visit you in Tokyo, you know. You didn't know that. Did you? I had no idea she wanted to come to Tokyo for a date with me. 
She had always made time for me, working around my schedule. She must have been waiting, knowing how busy I was in Tokyo. The more I realized how thoughtful she had been, the more I loved her. Even though it took so long, I was glad to make her dream come true this way. As I was thinking about this, Travis, dressed in a suit, probably on his way to a meeting, suddenly appeared in front of me. Hey, Michael. What are you doing here? Oh. Travis. Travis looked back and forth between Emily and me and said. Out with a girl on a weekday afternoon, huh? Must be nice. Oh, right, you're unemployed now. Thanks to you, I got a promotion. What? Emily let out a surprised voice. I hadn't told her I was unemployed. Let's go. Not wanting him to say anything more to her, I took her hand, trying to leave the scene. But just then, Travis grabbed my shoulder and shouted. Wait a minute. He then leaned in closer to Emily, scrutinizing her face, and said as if he had discovered something amusing. Whoa! What is this? This chick looks like a freak. Hey, don't tell me you got fired from your job because you were late saving this monster. You? Unable to hold back, I grabbed him by the collar. You can say whatever you want about me, but don't you dare insult her. Apologize to her. What? Why are you getting so worked up? It's annoying. Don't act all tough just because you're with some freakish girl. I was about to punch Travis when Emily, with surprising strength, pulled me back and said. Stop it. Michael. I'm fine, really. This kind of thing happens all the time, I'm used to it. So, please, just stop. It's okay. Don't get so heated over something like this. Can't even take a joke, huh? You two losers, an unemployed guy and a freak, are perfect for each other. Have a nice life. Feeling awkward after Emily's intervention, Travis muttered under his breath as he walked away. My insides were still boiling with rage. I felt ashamed of my inability to do anything and apologized to Emily. I'm sorry. Emily looked at me, confused, and said. Why are you apologizing? I'm the one who should be saying sorry. Her grip on my arm tightened. She continued. I kind of sensed things weren't going well for you. I was shocked to hear you got fired. But you were trying to act cheerful like you always do when things are tough. That's just how you are, I've known that since back then. I could tell you were really hurting. I was surprised that Emily had seen right through me. The fact that she remembered this quirk of mine and kept it to herself out of kindness made me realize I could never match her. It was for reasons like this that I had fallen for her. Then, I noticed that her hand, which was holding my arm, was trembling slightly. I wondered how deeply Emily had been hurt by Travis's cruel words. Overwhelmed by my feelings, I found myself embracing her tightly. She slowly nestled her cheek against my chest and began to speak in a trembling voice. I'm sorry, Michael. I'm used to this. It happens all the time. I'm okay. I tightened my arms around her and said, Don't get used to it. I'll protect you. I'll shield you from every cruel word, from anything that hurts you. You don't need to get used to it, let me protect you. We stayed like that for a while. Then, she slowly moved in my arms, lifted her face, and, already having stopped crying, took a deep breath and said, as if convincing herself, I'm done running away. I don't want to let go and regret it anymore. Seeing the determined look in her eyes, I thought once again how beautiful Emily was. A week later, my former workplace was in an uproar. 
Samuel, the executive director, rushed into the CEO's office with a flustered expression. Mr. Fletcher. This is serious. Look at the news. Turn on the TV. The news reported a sudden change in the CEO of Company K. Hey, what's going on here? We haven't heard anything from Company K. Travis. You're in charge, weren't you informed of anything beforehand? Robert, equally clueless, demanded answers from Travis. Hey. Travis. What's going on? Travis, who knew nothing, was flustered and panicked. I swear, I had no idea. This is all news to me. Oh, wait, the press conference is starting. The new CEO is about to appear. The announcement of the CEO change from Company K early that morning had thrown everyone into chaos. Naturally, Travis's company, which was one of Company K's major clients, was caught off guard. Unable to respond to something they hadn't been informed of. Calls for confirmation rang endlessly from subcontractors and competitors, and there were even suggestions to temporarily shut down the lines. Meanwhile, on TV, the press conference for Company K's new CEO was about to begin, and everyone in the office watched the screen with bated breath. The male host greeted the audience and began explaining the sudden leadership change. It was announced that the former CEO, Mr. Nelson, would retire to the position of chairman, and that his retirement was not due to any health issues or other negative reasons. Travis, eagerly waiting to see who the new CEO was, watched as a figure ascended the stage at the host's queue, and was so shocked he couldn't utter a word. I'm Emily Thompson, and I have been appointed as the new CEO of Company K. She spoke slowly and politely, but with a tone that conveyed strength and determination. One of the reporters asked, What is your relationship with Chairman Nelson? Chairman Nelson is my father. What? When Emily proposed this change to me, she explained the following. She and Chairman Nelson were technically parent and child by marriage. Chairman Nelson had been well known both inside and outside the industry as a lifelong bachelor, so I never knew he had gotten married. Emily's parents and Chairman Nelson had been friends since their university days, always together as a trio. However, when the fire broke out at Emily's house, her father died. In their time of need, Chairman Nelson stepped in and said, his family is like my own, and took care of them. Afterward, Chairman Nelson and Emily's mother got married, making him her stepfather. She told me that every time she saw the scars from the fire, she felt sadness and wondered, why me, sinking into a self-deprecating mindset. She had been holed up at home for a long time and, whenever she did go out, was subjected to stares of curiosity and pity which made her afraid of the outside world. Reuniting with me seemed to have given her the courage to step back into the light again. She said she wanted to become a CEO who could empathize with each employee, using her painful experiences to help others. When Emily's press conference ended, the room filled with applause and cheers. Back at the office, as they watched with bated breath, Robert turned to Travis, whose face had turned pale. We weren't told about the change in CEO or that he had a daughter. We can't just sit around. Travis. We need to go greet her immediately. Hey. Travis. Why are you standing there in a daze? We need to move quickly. Watching the press conference from a distance, with tears welling up in my eyes, my phone suddenly rang. Wondering who could be calling at such an important time, I checked the screen and, ironically, saw Travis's name displayed. I hesitated for a moment but decided to take the call, thinking it was an opportunity. Hello? What do you want? Hey, it's me, Travis. Sounds like a scam call. 
Hey, don't make fun of me. The new CEO of Company K, Emily Thompson, she's the woman you were with in the city, right? Yeah, the very woman you insulted as a monster. Come on, don't say that. It was just a figure of speech, not what I really meant. I was just jealous of you flirting with such a great girl. That's all. Travis was spouting his usual nonsense. I really can't stand him. I prompted him to get to the point. So, what do you want? I'm busy. If it's nothing important, I'm hanging up. Wait. Please. As a favor to an old colleague, could you help introduce her to our company? I knew it would be something like this, so I replied bluntly. What? No way. It's impossible. You guys better be prepared for what's coming. What do you mean? Did your company get any notice about the CEO change? No, right? That's what I'm saying. At worst, you're going to lose your contract. Goodbye. Don't call me again. I thought I heard Travis's desperate voice on the other end, but I ignored it and hung up. I must have looked really cold after hanging up the phone. Emily, who had just finished her press conference, noticed and asked me with concern in her voice. Was that a call? Who was it? I replied as if it was nothing, not wanting to trouble her. Oh, just someone I know. It wasn't anything important. Don't worry about it. She seemed relieved by my words, then showed me her palms, drenched in sweat, and laughed. I was so nervous. Look, my hands are all sweaty. Because of my experience in a similar industry, Emily had asked me to support her, and I ended up working under her. It was a rewarding job in a lively workplace with a great environment, and I quickly began achieving results. This led to a boost in the company's performance, and Company K soon became the undisputed leader in the industry. Meanwhile, Travis's company, having lost its contract with Company K, found itself left behind in the industry. Their number of contracts plummeted, and their performance hit an all-time low since the company's founding. As a result, Robert was demoted, and Travis faced a salary cut and demotion. It was said that a massive layoff was just a matter of time. Around the time Company K's performance started to soar, I was summoned by the former CEO, Mr. Nelson, who was Emily's stepfather. He was currently traveling the world with his wife on a very belated honeymoon. Under the guise of inspecting domestic and international locations as chairman of Company K. Since he wasn't around the company often, this was my first time speaking to him face to face. I was nervous about what he might say, but to my surprise, he bowed his head and said, Michael, thank you so much for everything you've done. Not understanding what he meant, I replied to Chairman Nelson. Please, raise your head. I haven't done anything. If this is about the CEO transition, it was all her doing. I really didn't do anything. Chairman Nelson continued. Actually, when I married Emily's mother, Emily was against our marriage from the beginning. And who could blame her? She had just lost her biological father, and here I was, suddenly becoming her new father. It wasn't easy. I didn't know how to approach her. Her mother would say, give it time, and things will work out, so I avoided dealing with it myself. I was surprised. I had always assumed that the relationship between the two of them had been good from the start. At the same time, I remembered that Emily could be surprisingly stubborn. And thinking about how her mother was such an optimist made me feel a bit nostalgic and amused. With all due respect, I really didn't do anything. It was all her hard work. So, 
As I hesitated, Chairman Nelson disagreed. No, you changed her. I couldn't do anything about the scars on her face or the wounds in her heart. Emily is a kind girl. So she treated me kindly as a friend of her parents. She used to call me uncle. But she never accepted me as her father. Even after the marriage, she continued to call me uncle, always keeping her distance. To think that this renowned bachelor, known for his success and charisma, who had built his company into a formidable force, would be so timid around his own daughter, it just goes to show you can't judge people by their appearances. But suddenly, she started calling me dad. I was so happy that I cried, and Emily laughed at me. I had been thinking about passing the business on to the younger generation, so I had been asking Emily if she would take over the company. She finally became open to the idea. I didn't quite understand what had happened, but I couldn't let this opportunity slip away. That's why the CEO transition happened so quickly. Of course, she still has much to learn to lead the company, and I'll be there to guide her. As I began to understand, the charming cool old man in front of me spoke with a mischievous glint. I never expected that a man like you was behind her change, Emily isn't to be underestimated, but I hope you'll stay by her side to support her. And maybe, just maybe, forever, Chairman Nelson said with a wink, clearly amused by his own mischief, leaving me flustered and scrambling to respond. Wait, what do you mean by that? We're not. He laughed and said, you can't fool me. The way you two talk about each other, hearts are practically floating out of your eyes. It's embarrassing to watch. I had no defense against that, so I decided to speak honestly about my feelings. I believe she will become a great CEO who understands the pain of others and supports her employees. I plan to stand by her and support her as best as I can. Eventually, I hope to build a life and a family with her, so when that time comes, I hope for your blessing, Dad. Feeling like I had scored a small victory, I glanced at him, but he was clearly one step ahead. With a calm smile, he said, I don't recall ever becoming the father of such a big son. But I wouldn't mind if it turned out that way in the future. As I stepped out of the chairman's office, feeling a sense of relief, I saw Emily waiting for me right outside the door. With a slightly anxious expression, she looked at me and asked. What did he say? Not wanting to explain it myself, I replied, you should ask him directly, Emily. But, clearly understanding most of it, she turned away with a playful pout and said, Michael, you're so mean. I'm not talking to you. And marched down the hallway with a huff pretending to be upset. To make up for it, I hurried after her, pretending to be flustered, and suggested. How about we go out for dinner with your parents sometime soon? I could even invite my mom to join us. Emily, catching my meaning, looked back at me with a smile and said, Oh? You mean? That sounds great. Let's pick a good date and plan it out. And so, I found myself walking down the path of life again with the woman I had loved since our college days but had once let go. A truly beautiful person is someone whose heart is pure and kind. It's not just about appearances. Emily, who understands the pain of others, is a truly beautiful person with an unyielding spirit. Someone who can stand with the weak is truly worthy of being a leader. I will do my best to support this wonderful woman and live our lives together.